Hello, hello. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Okay, so here we are at the Bodhi tree in Second Life at the Buddha Center and we are live and just now we are going to be continuing the study on the Arya Vasa Sutta and this is actually um, a talk given by the Venerable Mahasi Sayara and last time in the previous um, episode we just ended off with uh, the chapter on the nature of consciousness or the title and that was quite a while ago and so today we are continuing the study here in the text with insight knowledge of impermanence and so let me just check the live stream okay seems alright and I can just get the text up just a second here Okay, so I'm going to put the mouse here. Should be fine. Okay, so in the text, continuing on, and we're going to see if we can finish off today. So we just want to get right into the text. And so here it goes Inside knowledge of impermanence. With the emergence of this insight, oh, I just need to move the text a little bit. Okay. With the emergence of this insight, the yogi can distinguish between the origin and the end. These two phases of, an, of a phenomenon indicate respectively its arising and fading away. As the yogi notes this fact at every moment of his mindfulness, he gains insight into the nature of impermanence. The Pali term for this insight knowledge is Samasana Jnana. According to the commentaries, this insight knowledge has three aspects. One, the yogi knows the phenomena that are impermanent and two he knows the marks of impermanence and three he gains insight knowledge of impermanence the impermanent phenomena are all psychophysical complex or groups kandas that are for forever arising and passing away without sensation Oh, I'm sorry, without cessation. 
We recognize their impermanence because every unit of these psychophysical groups arises from non-existence, comes into momentary existence, and passes away into non-existence. This is the characteristic of impermanence. If a thing does not arise at all, we can say that it is permanent. As examples, we have Nibbana and conventional terms Nama Panyati. Um, nor can we regard anything as impermanent if it arises and exists forever. But in reality, in reality, there is no such thing. Everything that has a beginning has also an end. It is necessary to realize this sign, nimitta, of impermanence from experience. It is only when we see the constant flux of all phenomena during the practice of mindfulness that we can have a clear idea of impermanence independently. Anicca is the Pali term. Suffering and insubstantiality. Dukkha and Anatta. This insight knowledge, which, which the yogi acquires on his own as he knows the beginning and end, or arising and passing away, of everything, is called anicca vipassana jnana. In other words, it is the empirical insight into the nature of impermanence, and as such it leads to the realization of suffering. And insubstantiality, anatta, or non self as we might know it, anatta of life. When the yogi realizes anatta, he also realizes nibbana. This does not imply the attainment of the supreme goal of the Buddha Dharma. It, is, it means only the reflection at the level of samasana, uh, insight knowledge. When this insight knowledge develops through prolonged mindfulness and reflection on impermanence, suffering and non-self or insubstantiality, he stops reflecting and continues to be mindful. So when one reflects or reviews, one is not really mindful in the ultimate sense. And so he stops reflecting, reviewing, and continues to be mindful. clearly and thoroughly aware of the beginning and end of every sense object that is noted by him. This is called Daya Bhayana. Daya Bhayana. This is called Daya Bhayana in Pali. Inside knowledge stemming from the contemplation of the arising and passing away. He sees wonderful lights and experiences joy, peace, rapture, and ecstasy. There is an overwhelming upsurge of faith, lucidity, and devoutedness 
devoutness to the point of feeling that one knows everything or that one has attained Nibbana. These unusual experiences should be noted and eliminated. After transcending them, the yogi is left with vanishing of all phenomena as the object of his mindfulness. He no longer sees the image of belly or physical body when he notes the rising and falling. Whatever he notes, he finds the sense object as well as the cognitive element of consciousness disappearing one after another. When he walks, or she, when she walks, he notes, she notes, lifting the foot, putting it forward, putting it down. He sees only everything passing away without any mental picture of the foot or of the body. And so this is just one way of making a three-point note of the movement of the foot. And so maybe you, ha you use other words like we use lifting, stepping, and placing. I think, or um, whatever word that you can connect to the direct experience of lifting the foot, putting it forward, and putting it down. And in however many parts you choose to cut that up. Um, and so, from Panka, continuing on, from Panka to Sankara Upika, this inside knowledge of everything passing away is called Pankanyana. Some people criticize it, saying that it would create visions of a distorted figure with grotesque hands and feet. This shows that they have never experienced Pankanyana. Otherwise, they would not have talked such nonsense. Being confined to the dissolution of everything, this insight knowledge leads to fright, Pāyāñāna, which in turn helps to develop insight into the futility and emptiness of all conditioned existence, Adina vanyana So, the yogi ceases to enjoy life and become sick of it. Nipita jnana. He longs for a liberation. Nchitukamyata jnana. And in order to achieve his object, he resorts to special contemplation. Patisanka jnana. This result in the th uh, thorough comprehension of the three signs of life, impermanence, suffering, and insubstantiality, or non-self. But here we have insubstantiality of existence, Sankara Upekanyana. This insight knowledge is very subtle and much beneficial to the yogi. Okay, and okay. This insight knowledge is very subtle and of much benefit to the yogi. Objects of mindfulness arise conspicuously and automatically 
without any effort on the part of the yogi, you can remain mindful for a long time. With the emergence of Sankara Upekanyana, the yogi is in position of six attributes. In other words, the yogi attains equanimity in regard to the six sense objects. The Buddha described this spiritual quality as follows. O monks, the monk who has seen a visible object is neither pleased nor displeased. His mind is in equilibrium as it is not affected either by attachment or by aversion. This is because he has right mindfulness. Here we should note the words Chakuma Upandiswa, having seen the object. For otherwise we will miss the point which the Buddha wished to emphasize and bring home to his disciples. It makes no sense to speak of a man's defilements as linked to a sense object which he has never seen. It is not surprising that we neither love nor hate a man or a woman whom we have never met. On the other hand, we, can, we cannot but admire a person who knows some people but, not, but does not love them despite their loveliness or does not hate them either despite their repulsiveness. Such a person is the Arahat, or the Aryan Noble One. The Arahat is neither pleased nor displeased with what he has seen or heard or tasted. Most people are happy when they see the object which they love or get the object of their desire. Such sense objects cannot excite the arahat emotionally, nor does he feel unhappy or ill at ease because of his encounter with an unpleasant person. The arahant state of consciousness is restricted to bare awareness, and as such it is well balanced and devoid of greed or hatred. And delusions for the Arahant. Through mindfulness and right understanding, he notes every psychophysical event or phenomena, phenomenon as it really is strictly in terms of its characteristics of anicca, dukkha, and anatta. There is no cause for elation or dejection, pleasure or displeasure. No matter how delightful or unpleasant his sense impressions may be, he always remains indifferent to any sense object regardless of its emotional effect on other people. It is certainly possible for the yogi to strive for arahanship. According to the commentaries, one who seeks insight knowledge through the practice of contemplation is capable of attaining the equanimity ascribed to the arahant. Of course, no one can be assured of it. No one can be assured of it by merely listening to our sermons. He will have to strive for it strenuously and steadfastly, beginning with insight into the distinction between nama and rupa. and attain one stage after another until you gain 
Sankara Upeka Jnana Nama and Rupa The naming and forming form mind and body, body mind easy to remember. Self-examination. Uh, let me just move the mouse out here. I think it's okay. Self-examination. The tendency among some mo some meditators. Oh, I'm sorry. The tendency among some meditation teachers is to give lectures, flattering and gratifying to their disciples. They guarantee, for example, the attainment of suttapana. Sek and Sekiragami, the first two stages on the Aryan path, for those who would attend their lectures once or twice. This is, of course, pure propaganda to win the confidence of their disciple. It is up to the yogi to examine himself or herself on the basis of the Dhamma Dasa and the stages of insight knowledge on the Noble Path. Dhamma Dasa is the Buddha's sermon on how to evaluate one's spiritual progress on the path. In this way, we can find out whether or not he has attained the spiritual level promised by his teacher. The Dhamma Dasa. It is certainly a mistake for the yogi to regard himself or herself as a suttapan simply on the authority of his teacher or her teacher's verdict. A genuine suttapan has a firm, unwavering faith in the Buddha, as he, ha as he or she is well aware of the Lord's superhuman attributes. They are aware of the Lord Buddha superhumans. <laughs> it's a Superman attribute. I think it's supposed to say superhuman. Superhuman. Okay, so let me just read this one more time. A genuine Suttapan has a firm unwavering faith in the Buddha as he or she is well aware of the Lord's superman attributes. We should all just become aware at some point of that and then we are the Suttapan. Okay. His faith is so unshakable that he is prepared to hold on to it even at the sacrifice of his life. This kind of faith in the Buddha, stemming from the inside knowledge of the Lord's noble character, is one of what the Lord himself called the four mirrors of the Dhamma, Dhamma Dasa, or test assessing one's progress in the practice of the Dhamma. It's always interesting. Suttapana would definitely not have uh, be, be moved by any Brahmana, Sammana or monk in their faith in the religion. Dhammadasa. Should look that up. The yogi who practices the Dhamma knows independently too that as the Buddha pointed out, there are only psychophysical phenomena that arise and pass away ceaselessly, that they are all painful and devoid of ego entity. 
he sees Nibbana at the level of the path and fruition, Makkha, Pala, an experience that re reinforces his faith in the Buddha, just like a man who is confident of the physician who has effectively cured him of his illness. He has a firm faith, too, in the noble ones or arahants. The implicit faith in the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha is an impe impeccable moral uprightness in conformity with the five precepts constitute the four mirrors of, the, of Dhamma, Dhammadasa, that provide the tests for yogis who wish to assert, ascertain their extent wish to ascertain the extent of their spiritual progress. Sincere yogi, conformity to the moral precepts is to be natural and spontaneous and does not acquire and does not require deliberate effort or a sense of self imposed duty. It implies moral purity rooted in freedom from evil desire and violent evil passions. This is not to say that initial, initially there is no need for the yogi to exercise self-restraint to make himself morally pure. What we mean is that he should aim at a moral purity that is invulnerable to any violent desire to commit moral transgression. Therefore, he needs to examine himself or herself to see whether he has achieved such kind of moral purity. Otherwise, he may run the risk of being deluded like one of my former disciples. Once a layman came to me. He was not an ordinary person, but an educated and well-informed Buddhist. He said, that after he had meditated for several times, he was declared to be a suttapan by his teacher. In the Pitaka, there is no mention, no instance of such a verdict being given by an arahat other than the Buddha. We always consider it inadvisable to make such kind of judgment. On the other hand, we only give sermons on the stages of inside knowledge that will provide the basis for assessing one's spiritual progress. Nevertheless, because of his strong faith in his teacher, <coughs> the man believed himself to be a suttapan and observed the five precepts strictly. religious experience to an elderly monk, the 90-year-old monk still living and well-versed in the Pitika, is, an in, is intimate with me. The man told me, I'm sorry, the man told the old monk about his vision of the elements and phenomena evaporating during his experience of meditation and about the verdict teacher. Then learn Sayadaw. Oh, then the learned Sayadaw said that he was talking nonsense and that there was nothing to warrant 
his understanding of the Dhamma, let alone his claim to be a Suttapan Arya. The disillusioned man told me that after his interview with the outspoken Sayadaw, he no longer cared much for the strict observance of the five precepts. I advised him not to do like that, but to continue to lead a good moral life, whether other people said about him, whatever other people said about him. It is necessary for the yogi to avoid becoming a self-styled sotapan, like that lay disciple. Sure, 
some people may misunderstand and disparage him. They will have to abide by the grave consequences of their ignorance. Gotta be careful there. This is a fair warning, just in, in case anyone missed that. By the venerable societal renunciation of false views. The two Aryavasa Dhammas that we have to consider now are those which all are those which all for renunciation of what the Pali takes label Pachikasa Pachikasacha or Pachikasacha or false uh, heterodox views. So let me just read that again. I stumbled a little bit on, uh, on the words. So we're now at renunciation, false views. The two Aryavasa Dhammas that we have to consider now are those which all for n are all for renunciation of what the Pali text label Pachika Satcha or false heterodox views. So these are views private private views kind of thing. Um, so yeah, let's see. There are in brief two such views to, uh, to with one, the eternity view and two, the annihilation view. According to the first view, a living being survives death and continues to exist after taking up its abode in another physical body. To those who hold this view, believe it to be uh, the only truth and reject all others as wrong. So they are holding on to the view that a living being survives after death and continues to exist, uh, taking up its abode in another physical body. about total liberation from all views. 
relation to reality, but making us not see it clearly or even perverted. And so, so it becomes like uh, broken, right? Okay, as follows. about life after death give rise to ten kinds of delusions which are as follows. 1. A living being is not subjected to disintegration and dissolution after death but continues to exist eternally. When he dies, oh I'm sorry, 2. When he dies, he perishes and is annihilated. A living being is finite. For a living being is infinite. Infinite. Five. Life force or entity is identical with the physical body. Six. Life force or entity is distinct from the physical body. Like a soul or a spirit. Seven, a living being exists after death. Eight, a living being does not exist after death. Nine, a living being exists and does not exist after death. Uh, and ten, a living being neither exists nor is he non-existent after death. that need to be repudiated by those who keep oh by those who practice the Aryavasa Dhammas equally to be repudiated are the three false pursuits. Three kinds of pursuits. The pursuit of a human being is of three kinds. One pursuit of sensuous pleasure, two, pursuit of existence, and three, pursuit of a supposedly holy life. The first is the pursuit uh, of the people who seek sensual objects that delight them. The sensual desire motivating it uh, becomes wholly ex extinct only at the anagami level. stage on the holy path. Hence it is up to the yogi to try to reach this stage. As for the second pursuit that is dominated by the craving for existence, the attachment to life does not come to an end, even at the anagami stage. For then there is still the lingering desire for fine material existence. Bhava, or immaterial existence, Arupa Bhava. Oh. Okay, that's fine. I'm sorry. I just went on the screen. Okay, it is only Arah. This does not require special efforts. Um, if the yogi seeks it steadfastly through constant mindfulness, the third or last pursuit is that of the ignorant man who commits himself to a wrong way of life, mistakenly believing it to be the right path. All these false views 
of three kinds. One, sensuous thoughts. Two, malicious, malicious thoughts. And three, cruel or aggressive thoughts. These thoughts usually pass away if the yogi m mutes them. Or notes them. I'm oh sorry. If the yogi notes them. As soon as they arise in his mind. But it is necessary. of 
this kind of experience was once reported to me by a man who had meditated at our center. He said that formerly he believed in this existence of a permanent soul, but now reflection on his experience had revealed nothing about the soul, but only the arising and passing away.
So we're at the end. Conclusion.
have said earlier in this book, all Buddhists should steadfastly bear in mind that no one without total commitment to the five moral precepts can hope to become a Suttapana Arya. Now, I will elucidate the point a little further. My object so is to help enlighten some ill-informed people, and it is not my intention to corroborate, corroborate my statement again. For barring the writer referred to above, that has been
binding on all monks. In short, complete faith in the Buddha implies compliance with his teaching that in turn leads to moral purity. On the other hand, lack of faith means deficiency in moral life. Just as doubt about a physician's professional skill makes a patient reluctant to follow his advice. The Sutta Pana Arya is inspired with firm, unwavering, and intelligent faith in the Buddha. They have seen for themselves. They know for themselves. Likewise, he has implicit faith in the Dhamma and the Sangha. So he faithfully avoids doing anything by the Buddha as wrong or reprehensible. Even at the risk of his life, he abstained from doing evil. Moreover, because of his path-oriented energy, he does not learn he does not earn his livelihood illegally. Instead, he works hard to get money. Again, because of his path-based mindfulness, there cannot possibly arise in him violent, uncontrollable greed, hatred, etc. that can lead him to the lower worlds. By virtue of such faith, vigilance, mindfulness, and other moral qualities, the moral life of the Sutta Prana is absolutely pure and secure. and untarnished moral character that is 
this is the mirror of the Dhamma. The Aryan disciple who is totally committed to this Dhamma can declare that it is not possible for him to be reborn as a denizen of hell, an animal, a ghost, or a demon, that as a Suttapana he is no longer exposed to the danger of the four lower worlds, and that he has to pass through only three, through only the three higher stages of insight knowledge, prior to his supreme definitive liberation. Here, the last attribute of a genuine suttapan is what we wish to emphasize. The commentaries elucidated as follows: the Aryas cherished and adore the five moral precepts, and so they do not let it evaporate in afterlife. This observance of the five precepts is unblemished, spotless, and perfect, and is therefore conducive to the development of apana samadhi, attainment of ecstatic concentration, and Chara Samadhi, neighborhood concentration. Friendly neighborhood concentration. These Pali texts and commentaries show clearly that the Suttapana Arya's moral purity remains intact after death, and that it is essential to the attainment genuine tranquility or concentration, samadhi. In a sermon to Anattapintika in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha referred to the four chief attributes of the Suttapana Arya as mentioned in the Dhammadasa Sutta cited above. Furthermore, he pointed out that the Suttapana's freedom from five kinds of danger that best anyone who violates any of the five precepts. These dangers and danger that is set in the present life, danger in a future life, unhappiness and distress. The commentary describes the two kinds of danger in the present life as internal and external danger. For example, a man has committed murder. The external danger is the desire for retribution that arises in the sun, in the sum of the murder victim. The internal danger is his desire to foil the design of the enemy against his life. On the basis of these Pali texts and commentaries, all Buddhist monks and laymen alike, should take it for granted that Suttapana Arya will never violate the five precepts, and that his moral life is absolutely pure. They should bear in mind, once and forever, that a morally impure man who claims to be a Suttapana is a bogus, and not a genuine Suttapana in the common in, in the conformity with Pali texts and commentaries. And that was the whole note on the purity of the Suttapana, or the moral solidity. again for listening and may this Dhamma Aryavasa Dhamma take root and grow strong and may it be like a pillar for practice 